How exactly was the Eastern Roman Navy different from the earlier Western Roman one? I already made a detailed video about the late Roman Navy until the fall of the Western Empire, but as we all know the Roman Empire continued for a long time after the fall of the West in form of the Eastern Roman Empire and that empire sported quite an impressive navy for most of its history. In fact, that navy would play a quintessential role in saving the empire time and time again from certain destruction. So how did the Eastern Roman and later the Byzantine navy evolve during the course of the centuries? In the last video about the Roman navy, I talked in detail about the late Western Roman and early Eastern Roman navies. We got as far as the naval disaster of Cape Bon in 468 AD. Even then, the Roman Empire could assemble a giant fleet, the likes of which the Mediterranean had not seen in hundreds of years. 1,100 ships had been built by the Eastern Roman Empire under Leo I and a few hundred more were sent by the West under command of the Emperor Antemius and the Magister Militum Marcellinus of Dalmatia. I made a very detailed video about why this giant naval operation failed. It certainly did not fail for a lack of resources, but only due to the incompetence and wrong military decisions on part of the fleet commander Basiliscus. Only 8 years after this one of the most giant naval disasters in Roman history, Odoacer took over control in Italy. Julius Nepos and Suagrius soon after were killed and so the remainder of the Roman navy was now exclusively located in the Eastern Roman Empire. But of course, one could also argue that the Germanic kingdoms, especially the Vandals, still possessed remnants of the former Western Roman navy, since they just captured the vessels in the Roman ports. Especially the Vandal fleet must have been comprised to a large part of captured Roman vessels. However, after the dissolution of the Western Empire, now the Eastern Roman Empire would carry on the legacy of the Roman navy. The main ship of this Eastern Roman navy after around the year 500 was the Dromon. This was a type of galley, which in itself was an evolution of the Roman Liburnia, which was the main ship design in use when the Western Empire still existed. It is quite interesting to see that the Eastern Roman Dromon was essentially still very similar to the late Roman Liburnia, both in design and function. This type of vessel would now serve the Eastern Roman navy for hundreds of years and would change only little during the course of the following centuries. After the disaster of Cape Bon, the East had to lick its wounds for quite some decades because the loss of 600 ships due to the folly of Commander Basiliscus almost bankrupted the Eastern Empire. But already some 60 years later, Belisarius had managed to conquer the Vandal Kingdom and he set out from Constantinople with a fleet of about 550 ships, most of them transport ships but of course accompanied by many Dromons. So we see that the Eastern Roman navy had impressively recovered from the disaster of Cape Bon, since a fleet of 550 ships is certainly very impressive. Just as a comparison, the Roman fleets involved in the Battle of Actium in the civil wars of the late Roman Republic counted about 400 ships on one side and 300 ships on the other. So we are talking about fleet sizes here comparable to the early Roman days. Even Majorian's fleet counted only 300 ships and hence Belisarius' 550 ship Vandal conquering fleet had a quite impressive size. Later then in the Gothic Wars, the Ostrogoths under their king Totila built a pretty impressive fleet of 400 ships. At the Battle of Sena Gallica in 551, an Eastern Roman fleet clashed with an Ostrogothic one and the East won decisively. Not long later, the Ostrogoths were completely defeated and so after this, the Eastern Roman Empire was again the undisputed master of the Mediterranean. Thus, in the era of the late Emperor Justinian, this sea could once again be called Mare Nostrum. During this new height of the Eastern Roman Empire, it stretched again from the Levant all the way to the old province of Hispania, which was now called Spania. The size of the Eastern Roman war fleet must have measured around 600 ships during these days. But not long after Justinian, the Roman Empire would be faced with new threats. First, the Lombards conquered large parts of Italy in the late 560s and early 570s, quite certainly with the help of the remaining Ostrogoths. 
But even despite this blow, the Eastern Roman Empire still remained the undisputed master of the Mediterranean Sea. The first real challenge for that fleet would come in 626. In that year, the Persians and the Avars had encroached Constantinople, two massive armies from the east and from the west, and here the Roman fleet would prove absolutely instrumental in lifting the siege. Both the Avar fleet and the Persian fleet was completely destroyed by the Roman fleet, and so the siege was over, since now the Romans could bring unlimited supplies into Constantinople, making it impossible for the besiegers to have any hopes of capturing this mighty bulwark of Constantine. But not long later, the Eastern Romans would now face a formidable enemy. The Persians and Avars were defeated, but only some 10 years later, a new threat would storm into Egypt and the Levant from Arabia. Both the Persians and the Eastern Romans were weakened by decades of relentless and brutal wars, and so the Muslims had pretty easy game in conquering large parts of the Eastern Roman Empire. With the loss of these provinces, indeed we could now start calling this empire the Byzantine Empire, because the Roman Empire had now lost its most important provinces and a strong cultural transformation would now follow. And if you are a Rome nerd like me, then you will certainly love the wonderfully detailed handcrafted rings and other Roman accessories by the SPQR shop. These guys make really amazing items, carefully handcrafted, and you will certainly find something in their shop, link in the description. And they even make the one and only official Majorianus channel ring, which you can order in bronze and even silver to honor the legacy of the Emperor Majorian. I like to think that Majorian would be proud if he could see that. With the code Majorianus, you even get a 10% rebate on every one of their items. So go and check out their amazing shop. And you can now even order Majorianus merch. Yes, indeed. Mugs or t-shirts on my official merch page which I of course also link in the description. Julius Valerius Majorianus would be quite surprised to see all this merch. And Rikima would be super jealous because he does not get a single item. Quite amazing stuff, so go and check it out. The first naval engagement between the Byzantine Empire and this new adversary, the Muslim Caliphate, was the Battle of the Masts in 654. Here, Two giant fleets met in what is now the coast of southern Turkey near modern-day Finike. The Byzantine fleet consisted of 500 ships, whereas the Rashidun Caliphate only had 200. This battle ended in a disastrous defeat for the Byzantine Empire. Their entire 500-ship fleet was destroyed. It is very likely that in order to lose against an enemy with such inferior numbers, absolute incompetence must have been at play on the side of the Byzantines. Their Emperor Constans II, quite likely having had no experience whatsoever, was not a brilliant naval commander and so barely escaped this encounter with his life. And it is quite likely that this total disaster, the likes of which the Romans had not witnessed since the Battle of Cape Bon 200 years prior, would have spelled the end for this remainder of the old Roman Empire. But as if answering the prayers of the Byzantine population, there came someone who saved the old empire of Constantine from certain doom. A certain Kalinikus from the city of Heliopolis that had been overrun by the Muslims had brought a powerful invention to Constantinople, Greek fire. The first use of this new super weapon of late antiquity or the early middle ages was reported in 672. However, it was only in 717 and 718 that it would bring the Byzantine empire a great victory. The Umayyad Caliphate had expanded so much that Constantinople was once again under siege. And here indeed Greek fire gave the Byzantines such an advantage that they managed to completely destroy and capture a fleet of 760 ships, thus saving Constantinople from certain doom. During these times, since now the culture of the Eastern Romans had become fully Greek dominated, so did the organization of this now Byzantine fleet change. During Roman times, the fleets were organized in the classes system. I talked about it in detail in this video here. However, since as we said massive cultural shifts took place in the early to mid 600s, so did this system change and the fleet was henceforth organized in the Caravisiani system. Caravisiani can be literally translated as seamen. They were mentioned for the first time around the year 680 
and formed in largely the same way as the land army's themes. They were a distinct military corps named after its soldiers and headed by a strategos. Progressively, however, the Karabisiani fleet was split into several regional thematic fleets, while the central imperial fleet was maintained at Constantinople, guarding the city and forming the core of naval expeditions. By the late 8th century, the Byzantine navy, a well-organized and maintained force, was again the dominant maritime power in the Mediterranean. Thanks to this reorganization, but also due to the technological superiority of Greek fire. In 727, a revolt of the provincial thematic fleets, largely motivated by resentment against the emperor's iconoclasm, was put down by the imperial fleet through the use of Greek fire. Despite the losses this entailed, some 390 warships were reportedly sent to attack Damietta in 739, and in 746 the Byzantines decisively defeated the Alexandrian fleet at Keramaya in Cyprus, breaking the naval power of the Umayyad Caliphate. The Byzantines followed this up with the destruction of the North African flotillas and coupled their successes at sea with severe trading limitations imposed on Muslim traders. Given the empire's new ability to control the waterways, this strangled Muslim maritime trade. With the collapse of the Umayyad state shortly thereafter and the increase in fragmentation of the Muslim world, the Byzantine navy was left as the sole organized naval force in the Mediterranean. Thus. During the latter half of the 8th century, the Byzantines enjoyed a second period of complete naval superiority. The antagonism with the Muslim navies continued with alternating success, but in the 10th century, the Byzantines were able to recover a position of supremacy again in the Eastern Mediterranean. Around the year 900, the Byzantine navy consisted of 300 warships, which is still a very respectable size. Nikephoros Phokas commanded a fleet of 100 dromons, 200 kelandias, which is a modified type of dromon that could even transport horses, and 308 transports, so a total fleet size of 608 ships and 77,000 men, a truly massive fleet size that would even have made the old Romans proud. After Crete was restored to Byzantine rule, a new period of naval supremacy began for the Eastern Roman Empire. But like so often, when few adversaries remain, complacency starts to set in. While still respectable in the age of Basil II, already by 1078, the Byzantine fleet had started to decline. But even Manuel I Komnenos still commanded a fleet of 150 ships against the Venetians, winning a victory for the Byzantine Empire in 1171. Logically though, after the disastrous sack of Constantinople in 1204, so did the Byzantine fleet decline even more. This marked the end of Byzantine naval domination of the Eastern Mediterranean for good, from which it would never recover. Hence, the later fleet sizes never again reached much more than a hundred ships throughout the entire 14th century. By 1400, the Byzantine fleet consisted of only a handful of vessels that were anchored at Constantinople. The last Byzantine naval victory was achieved in 1427 at the Battle of the Echinades Islands where the despot of Epirus was defeated and his possessions annexed by the Byzantines. But we can imagine that this battle hardly involved more than a handful of ships. The last naval engagement of Byzantine history took place when three Genoese galleys escorting a Byzantine transport fought their way through the huge Ottoman blockade fleet and into the Golden Horn during the siege of Constantinople in 1453. And with the final fall of Constantinople, so ended the Byzantine or Eastern Roman navy, which had at times dominated the entire Mediterranean and which was a formidable fighting force well into the 12th century, giving the Byzantines naval domination for hundreds of years. Thus, the entire Roman navy lasted from the times of the mid-Roman Republic, when the first giant fleet was built in the First Punic War in the 3rd century BC, all the way until the 15th century AD. Thus, the Roman naval power dominated the Mediterranean Sea for around 1300 years, which is quite a remarkably long time period. And please like and subscribe so that you won't miss any future videos on the fascinating era of the late Roman Empire. And please consider supporting my work on Patreon or via YouTube membership 
because the long-term sustainability of this channel really depends on your support. This channel would not work without our amazing Patreon and YouTube members and I want to thank each and everyone who is supporting this channel in any form. Gratias Tibiago Amiki. And if you want to learn more about the late Western Roman Navy, you can watch this video in the upper right corner. But if you are more interested in learning about why the epic landing operation at Cape Bon failed, you can watch the other video in the lower right corner. I say thanks again to all friends of Roman history, gratias Tibiago and bene valete.